Okay, we get started, everybody. You're all very welcome. Good morning. Happy Christmas. We're still in December. Happy Christmas. I um, thought we'd start today with a prayer, just to get us all settled and ready. Loving Lord, Heavenly Father, Father Lord, we come before you to worship you, to praise you, to bless your holy name. Father, please let your presence be known. Please settle our hearts and settle our minds. Father, please take away all the anxiousness and anxieties and all the stresses that this season brings. The happiness is but fleeting, but the stresses and all of that goodness comes with it. Father, please settle us so we can worship you as you deserve to be worshipped. We ask this in the blessed name of our Lord and our Saviour, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to have the first song, and it's in Songs of Victory, number 60, and it's Great is Thy Faithfulness. Songs of Victory, number 60, 60. If you could all stand, please. turn to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, 
verse 15, please. That's Luke 2, verse 15. Luke 2, 15. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from then into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem, and see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord hath made known to us. And they came with haste, and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad, and saying which was told them concerning this child. They heard from the angels and they went. They didn't wait. They didn't read. They didn't study. They didn't go on the internet and go on Google. Didn't ask their friends. The angels appeared. We don't know if they spoke. We don't know if they sang. We, we like to think they sang. But it's not what the scripture actually says. The angels appeared. And they went. These are the shepherds. These, these are the lowest of the low. The spat upon, rejected people. And they went. The angels appeared to them. They responded. They didn't respond, stop. They responded, go. We have to respond. Do we go? Do we stay? Do we take the gift that's being given into our hearts? The truth that's being given to us? Do we take it? Do we hide it? As the song says, do we hide it under a bushel? Do we hide it away under a table? Or do we give it out? Do we respond? Do we go? There must be a response in every true believer. Go or stay. The very first witnesses of our Savior, their response was go. Go now. Go find this Savior that has been born. This Messiah that has been promised. If Jesus is the Savior, and he is, we all have to respond in the same way. As Luke 2.17, just repeating it. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. They made known abroad. They went out. They didn't stay in their fancy houses. In the case of shepherds, their fancy huts in the fields on the mountains. They didn't stay together and say, you know, we're not going to share this. They went out. They sang with joy, I'd like to think. Again, we don't know, but they went abroad. They spread the truth. They go. They didn't pass the homeless person on the street. Say, ah, oh, she's only going to use the money for alcohol. They didn't turn their nose up to other people who were unbelievers. Gone, sure, they don't know the truth. We know what's happening, really. They stopped and said, do you know what I've just seen? The Messiah, he's come. The Savior is here. Go. They retold the Christian message over and over and over and over. You can be guaranteed before Paul, our great apostle who wrote so many epistles, to the guidance absolutely of the Holy Spirit. They knew because that message that the shepherds had taken abroad was known. Before Paul stepped foot out, they knew because the shepherds had spread that message. The lowly shepherds, the us. No disrespect to anybody here. We're all shepherds. We're all lowly. Even the richest person in the world is a lowly shepherd. All the money in the world can give you nothing. If you lose your life, lose your soul. They're the first witnesses. They're not orators. They're not high and mighty people. They're not apostles. They're not priests. They're not rabbis. They're not popes. They're not bishops. They don't wear white robes or hats or sing songs to statues that don't talk back to you. They don't get worried when their little figurines get taken away from them and they chase them down the road. They're shepherds and they go. They respond. Lowly, scruffy shepherds. We're going to do our second song now. And it's on the projector. And it's God of Wonders. I'm going to pass the bag around. If you're new, please let it pass. Please. If you're... Anything to give, please give it so. Thank you. We could all stand. It's God of Wonders on the projector, please.
Let's give thanks for the gifts. Lord, Heavenly Father, these gifts that people have given for you, Father, Lord, we pray that the blessings and the knowledge is given upon those in control of that money and they use it to glorify you and to grow your kingdom as you see fit, Lord. You don't need men. You don't need money. You could do it with shepherds in the field. But Father, we ask that you please use it as you see fit and you bless those in control, Lord. We ask this in the blessed name of our Lord and Saviour, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. All religions tell you to do, to go, to build. They tell you to build towers. Back in Genesis, in Genesis 11, 4, for those you want to turn, Genesis 11, 4. Shouldn't be too hard to find, it's at the start. Genesis 11, 4. And they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven and let us make us a name lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. They built the tower to reach to heaven. They built the city to speak to God. That's what we have today. They built big castles, as my children call them, churches. They're as good as castles because they're holding themselves in, letting themselves out. No matter where you go, what denomination, we're told to strive. We're told to become like, can't become God. That's an impossibility. There is only one God. You can't be like God. He is God. There's none like him. You can't do anything to earn his favour. You heap coals upon yourself if you try. It's dirty rags. We have a relationship with our Lord. We don't have religion. People say, what religion are you? I say, I'm not a religion. What are you talking about religion? I have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. He's my saviour. What? Is that your religion? No. Relationship. I can talk to my Lord and my saviour as you can. Any time of the day, any time of the night, when something is struggling within your heart, talk to him. He's there listening. He's not a butler to provide blessings and mercies upon you. We are but his servants. He uses us, we don't use him. Our father is always looking upon us and he's always listening. When you're ever alone, you're not. It's an impossibility, as David said. I cannot go up, down, left, or right in my words. There's nowhere I can go that you cannot be or are not. There's nowhere. There's nothing you can go through that he cannot get you through it. See, just as in Genesis 11:4, we build, we go up, we try and wear fancy clothes, we try and bow the right amount of times and shake the right amount of hands and sing the right songs in the right way. We try and put stained glass windows and statues and figurines and I could go on and on and on and on and on. But that's not what God wants. God came down and destroyed that. He scattered them. God came down because we cannot go up. If you just continue down, Genesis eleven five, And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men build. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they all one language. And this they began to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to. Go to, let us go down, and dare confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. Now there's a whole meaty substance in that that I'm not even going to touch on. But God had to come down. The angels had to reveal it to the shepherds, which man had known for the previous two and a half thousand years that the Messiah would come, that he would come, that he would save us from our sins. We live now 
give or take four, four and a half thousand years later, after these people building this tower, we are here now with the same message that the prophets knew and spoke of, that the angel received and went out. They go. You can't live a sinless life. It's an impossibility. We've had Christmas now and we're all a little bit stressed out. I was asked that question, how are we getting on today? Fine, can't wait to go back to work for a break. That's where I am today. I can't wait to go back to work for a break. We all make mistakes. He's sinless. We are not. We have a father who listens, who watches, who intercedes. Our <coughs> loving heavenly father. He is God the father. He is God the son. He is the Holy Spirit. They are one. He mediates for us. He intercedes for us. If we've all ate too much and drank too much and said the wrong thing or not said when we should have witnessed to those, go to Jesus. Go to Jesus and tell him. That's what I had. I was convinced I was going to... I'm, this week, I'm going to witness to everybody what a perfect time to witness. Didn't happen. Chickendale. Absolutely Chickendale. Set back, didn't take the opportunities as God had brought them. Put me in my place. But salvation is not something I earn or something I build. Salvation is a person. The person of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our salvation. We can't lose him. Could you all please turn to the book of Acts? We're going to Acts 17. And verse 6. Acts 17, verse 6. And when they had found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. The same message that the shepherds received, the same message that the prophets preached, the same message that our Lord and Saviour on his time upon the earth when he walked amongst us, he preached. Is the message that they have turned the world upside down. In a world of fake news, fake friends, fake likes, Instagram, Facebook, face, book, book. Only book. There's no Facebook. No fake news. No fake likes. There's only one truth. It's not your truth and my truth and his truth and her truth. There's the truth. There is only one truth. This is the truth. The same truth that our Lord had come here to save us from our sins. The sins we've already committed... The sins we are committing now in our thoughts. The sins we're going to commit when we walk outside the doors. He saved us from all of them. Jason turned the world upside down. That message turned the world upside down. We have the same truth here in us, in this book, in this room, that can turn the world upside down. Will we go home and have our dinner and close our doors and not say anything to anybody? Or will we go to work tomorrow or see our friends and our neighbours? Use Facebook and use Instagram and use Twitter and all of these modern social media platforms and get the message out. The truth. The only truth. To be a real friend, not a fake friend. To give a real like because I like you enough. I'm going to tell you the truth. The truth the angel spoke about to the shepherds 2,000 plus years ago. It's the same truth that we have. It's the same truth that we step over people walking down the street. Instead of stopping. Saying, here's a few bob. Here's a cup of coffee. I don't care what you're going to do with that money. Because the Lord put it upon my heart to give it to you. If you're going to drink that. It doesn't matter. I have an opportunity to tell you the truth. Do you want to hear the truth? Yeah. Here's a fiver. 
Here's a euro. Here's 50 cent. I'm going to give you this if you let me talk to you for a minute. Okay. It's amazing how much truth you can get to someone who's in need. Still the truth. We're here to publicly praise our Lord. Publicly praise him and worship him. Out there we can turn the world upside down. But we can turn each other upside down also. We can't always assume that everyone here is a believer. Some people just like to come somewhere on a Sunday and sit and stand and clap and be involved and have a cup of tea and a cup of coffee and share. But not everybody in this room is necessarily a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Saviour. So I ask whoever isn't, please call upon his name. Ask him to come into your life. It's the only message. It's the only thing we can say. Turn the world upside down. I'm just going to finish on Luke. Swing back, please, to the left. Luke chapter 2, verse 20. Luke 2, 20. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. Glorifying God. And praising God. They didn't go back to the field. They didn't take the message back to the caves. They didn't take the message far away. The message was gone. It had gone out. They took that message and go. It was already out there. That's my verse for today. That's my verse for life. Take the message and go. We're going to go to open time now. Please, if you wish to share what the Lord has done in your life this week, over the last couple of weeks, or something you're struggling with, please take this opportunity to share with each other, ask for prayer. If you'd like to play some music, the lads would be only happy to step aside if you'd like to sing a song of praise to our Lord. If you'd like to read a piece of scripture, please do so.
going to look at a few verses in the book of Psalms. If you would turn to Psalm 90, please. In your Bible, you might have a little super, what they call a superscription or whatever, before Psalm 90. And it may say, a prayer of Moses, the man of God. The prayer of Moses, the man of God. And as far as we know, this is the only psalm out of the 150 that is ascribed to Moses, the man of God. And quite likely, as we would uh, read through Psalm 90, the, the background is that uh, Moses has been used of the Lord to go into Egypt, where the Lord had heard the affliction of his people and gave Moses the commandment to go and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And then when we read through Exodus, we know the, that uh, Pharaoh's heart was hardened and the Lord sent the plagues. In the 10th plague, uh, Pharaoh released his grip, allowed the Israelites to go. They crossed the Red Sea and the Lord was going to bring them into the land of promise, uh, the land with milk and that flowed with milk and with honey. But uh, very sadly, when we see how the children of Israel, how they constantly did not believe the Lord, how they constantly provoked the Lord and they, they tested him until finally at a place called, uh, if I'm pronouncing it right, Kadesh Barnea, they did not believe the Lord to go into the good land that he had prepared for them. So the sentence uh, upon them was everyone uh, 20 years old and older would perish and not be able to go into the land. And uh, they wandered around in vanity, in the wilderness, in the Sinai there, just wasting their days, days after days, weeks after weeks, months after months. And basically they were just waiting for that generation to perish and to pass on. And the Lord was going to send the next generation and open up and bring them into the good land that he had promised. So if that is the background here, and I believe it's a, very likely that it is, uh, they're in Sinai. And in Sinai, if you've seen pictures, it's desolate. It's not very welcoming. It's uh, hot, but it's very cold at night. It's just a desert. And then there's these jagged, naked peaks of Sinai. There. They're just, you almost seem to be devoid of any grass or green or trees or plants just naked rock, unfeeling and just looking down. And they're surrounded like that into this wilderness. And then we read the prayer of Moses, the man of God. It says, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn man to destruction and say, Return, O children of men. For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past, and like a watch in the night. You carry them away like a flood. They are like a sleep. In the morning they are like grass which grows up. In the morning it flourishes and grows up. In the evening it is cut down and withers. For we have been consumed by your anger, and by your wrath we are terrified. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your countenance. For all our days have passed away in your wrath. We finish our years like a sigh. The days of our lives are seventy years, and if by reason of strength they are eighty years, Yet their boast is only labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. Who knows the power of your anger? For as the fear of you, so is your wrath. So teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long and have compassion on your servants O oh, satisfy us early with your mercy, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad according to the days in which you have afflicted us, the years in which we have seen evil. 
Let your work appear to your servants and your glory to their children. And let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. There's the one verse I just want to kind of focus on out of uh, the 17 that we read in Psalm 90, and that's verse 12. That's, so teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. And everything that we read there is uh, Moses looked up at those jagged peaks of Sinai and they just seemed timeless. They just seemed eternal. That as people and generations pass away, pass away, the mountains remain. And the Moses making reference, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, wherever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. The little ones I was holding here, they, they like Buzz Lightyear from uh, Toy Story. One of the things Buzz Lightyear says, to infinity and beyond, right? Think infinity and beyond. We read here with the Lord God, from everlasting, from eternity to eternity. What, it's a measureless span, it's from infinity and beyond. And Moses looking up and extolling and giving glory to God that God is timeless. God is eternal. A thousand years in his sight are like nothing, like a watch in the night. And opposed to the everlasting God, we see you and we see me. Like grass, we grow up, we wither, and we cut down. Um, so often we cut the grass. I've been cutting that grass for I don't know how many years now. And uh, I enjoy it. I like it. But beside that, uh, I cut it and it grows up again. I cut it and it grows up again. Um, several years ago, I went out maybe on a July or whatever it was, and there was all kinds of flowers and they were grown up. And I cut it down. The world, the, the, the garden doesn't even remember it anymore because another crop came up. I cut it down. Another crop came up. And opposed to God being everlasting, there is you and I, generation after generation after generation. Here we are blessed to have life and breath and strength and health. But we know as things continue, it's not like you were saying, the grandparents, right? We're passing and another one comes up as opposed to the everlasting God. But in verse 12, we read, in light of that, because of that, because God is eternal and we are mortal, because God is always has been and always will be, and we're just passing through. In light of all of that, so teach us, teach us, Lord, to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. In light of all of that, please help us to be wise, Lord. Please help us to be understanding. Please help us to teach us to number our days. If you would turn to Psalm 39. Now this is what Moses was praying. In Psalm 39, see David has a very similar prayer. How many generations came and went between Moses and David, I'm not sure. But David had a similar prayer in Psalm 39, starting in verse 4. David prayed, Lord, make me to know my end and what is the measure of my days that I may know how frail I am. Indeed, you have made my days as a hand breath and my age is as nothing before you. Certainly every man at his best state is but vapor. The other version says is but vanity. And there is David, and his prayer was, Lord, make me to know my end. Make me to know where I'm going. Lord, in light of my mortality and my quick passing, make me to understand and make me to know. Moses said, uh, teach me to number my days. Teach us to know our days. Uh, 
And in, uh, back in, in Psalm 90, verse 12, that number, when it says, teach us to number our days, the Hebrew word means to count, to count them up. And in verse in, uh, Psalm 39, verse 4 here, it says, make me to know my end. And what is the measure? That our time is measurable, that it's finite. I was uh, walking over here. I brought a few things with me. And uh, little Zachary said, why are you bringing all those things or whatever? I said, well, to when I talk today, I'm going to use them to talk to the people. He says, my pastor doesn't do that. So I guess he, your pastor can do with words that I need help with. So here's a, a steel rule, right? And there's the, the measurements marked off. And all of us are measured. David says, I believe it's David in the Psalms, says elsewhere that my times are in your hand. My times are in your hand. That we're seated here, that you're listening to me, carry on as I'm doing here. It's a gift of God to you because your times are in his hand. When uh, David was rebuking Belshazzar, he said that his next breath was in God's hand. That your next breath that you just drew and maybe a couple breaths before you weren't even thinking about is in God's hand. What a precious gift, the gift of life. And David said, uh, help me to know it, that to measure my days. And, and Moses there, teach us to number our days. That they're finite. You need to be about things that are eternal. Uh, Moses, or David, went on to say there that, um, that I may know how frail I am. And I was looking up the, the word in um, an old, what they call an etymology dictionary. And it's like, where did this word come from? And I was surprised that the word fail, according to this dictionary, said back from the 1300s, it meant moral weakness. But wow, that's me. Not only am I frail and perishing, but I'm morally weak. Help me, Lord. And then I saw there was a quote, um, and the quote said this, Frailty, thy name is woman. So I uh, thought, you know, when I talk to one of my daughters about that. Now I have two daughters, so you don't know which one. So I said to my one daughter, one of the two, I said, tell me if you think this is sexist. Frailty, thy name is woman. And I think she says something like, you try to give birth without an epidural. <laughs> I said, but Shakespeare said that. <laughs> she said, what did he know? <laughs> so, yeah. But uh, the point being, we are indeed frail. We're to measure and to, to count our days. I'll tell you what kind of spurred this um, on my heart to share with you several reasons. Number one, it is the last Sunday of the month. And as we measure our time, another year has just about passed and has gone. And uh, it was last week we had an oil delivery. And as we had an oil delivery, the, the oil man, he went into, climbed up in his truck and he did this, that, and the other. And he said something like before he left, I think he said, oh, I have a present for you. And he handed me this. And I don't know, I think they've given me these in the past. But when he gave it to me, it just really struck me. He says, I have a present for you. What would you think if God were to say to Victor and Rosa and everyone here, here's a present for you, another year. I like this count. You can actually see the days and count them. They're going to go by. They're finite. They're passing. But just to think that God has said, here's a present for you. And Moses said, teach us to number our days. That we may apply our hearts to wisdom. What are you going to do with these days that the Lord has given to you? Now, in saying that, just this week alone, if you were following the news, you knew that there were people, some of them very young people, that did not get this day, let alone next year. There were people, young people, that thought this was like years to them. And yet, suddenly, without warning, they were taken and they didn't get the gift that you and I have today. But 
We see here all these days. What am I going to do with these days? Am I going to be like the Israelites in the wilderness, just waiting to die, just going round and round, chasing vanity, just filling up these days with things that don't, are not meaningful, things that are not eternal? Um, when I go to the nursing home, I think I told you this before, my father, who's been long gone now, but he had a, his uh, description of, of the nursing home was God's waiting room. God's waiting room. And um, I think, you know, as I think about that, without the Lord, without the Lord filling these days, without the Lord helping me, and because I am frail, I need help. I need a strength and a power outside of myself to come to me and give me grace and wisdom to apply my heart to wisdom, that these days would not be vain, but that these days would be meaningful and that these days will count for something. I don't want to be like those Israelites, just God, my life being God's waiting room, just filling it with time and entertainment and just waiting for when it's time for me to go. I want the days to be meaningful. And I trust that you do too. And that prayer of Moses, the man of God, teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. The other thing I threw up here was this tin, this can. And something about this tin in this can was on the back it has directions. In the back it has preparation, and then it says application. That word there, application. And as long as I leave this in the tin, I can buy it, I can store it, I can possess it, but if I do not apply it, it profits me nothing. It profits me nothing. And as I looked up that word in our, in our Bible, a few verses there in uh, Psalms particularly, or uh, Proverbs. In Proverbs uh, chapter 2, verse 2. I think it's very appropriate because uh, Proverbs is the book of wisdom. Proverbs is there to teach you and me practical wisdom in this life. And what a shame that we neglect that book so often as we do. But just a few verses in Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 2, verse 2. <clears throat> so that you incline your ear unto wisdom and apply your heart to understanding. Proverbs twenty two seventeen, Bow down your ear and hear the words of the wise and apply your heart unto my knowledge. Proverbs twenty three twelve, Apply your heart unto instruction and your ears, I'm sorry, and your ears to the words of knowledge. Application, as Moses had prayed there, uh, teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. What does it take that those days that I flipped before us there, what will it take that they will be meaningful and Purposeful. I thought, wow, if I just had one verse uh, to be able to pin it to our hearts and our minds so that we might indeed apply it. And I ransacked my little brain. I really couldn't come up with it, except maybe where we're told to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I remember when I was 19, many years ago, and it was then that people were sharing the gospel to me. And this was all new to me, hearing about the Lord Jesus in a personal way. I mean, I had heard about the Lord Jesus in a official way. I kind of heard about him in a way that was ecclesiastical. But here I was being introduced, or maybe the better word is confronted by people who had a meaningful purposeful 
relationship with the Lord Jesus. And I was confronted by that. I was introduced to that. And then I was challenged by that. Well, what do I do? Do I remain in the state I am? I didn't think exactly like this, but this was the general drift of it back when I was 19. You know, getting stoned, getting high, partying, chasing out of whatever, chasing whatever is entertaining. Or do I give my life to Jesus Christ? And I was confronted with that challenge. And I, from what I remember, what pushed me gently over the edge when I was such a young man back then was I thought that if I were to go on my entire life knowing that the Lord Jesus Christ is there, that God is real, and I were to live the rest of my life ignoring him, ignoring him, then whatever I did, whatever I accomplished would be absolutely meaningless if God was really there and I knew it and I lived my life ignoring him. And then when I was 19, by God's grace, I passed from death to life. I called on the name of the Lord as the wonderful promise says, whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I look back now after being almost 64, and uh, looking back, I do not regret one moment. If I have any regrets, is that I did not live more fully. I did not give myself more wholly to the living God who, live, who is from everlasting to everlasting. I was thinking of some of our young people here without pointing my fingers at them so much. And I believe it's in Ecclesiastes to remember your creator in the days of your youth. To remember your creator in the days of your youth. And to our younger uh, folk here, I would say, I don't have any money on me, but if I were to hold some up and to give a challenge to every older person here, parent, grandparent, or whoever, who would go back and say, oh, I wish I had partied more. Oh, I wish I had more sexual partners more. Oh, I wish I could only go back and indulge myself and give myself over to drugs and rock and roll and what, all this other stuff. I doubt there's one person here that would, say, would take me up on that. I would think every person here would say, if I had those days over again, if I could go back the years when I was 20, the years when I was 25, the years when I was 35, or whatever it might be, where are they now? They're chaff in the wind. If I had gone back, what would I do? I would remember that my days are finite. I would remember that my days are bleating and passing ever so quickly. And I would remember, and I would hopefully my prayer would be, oh God, teach me to number my days that I might apply my heart to wisdom. That I might know my end, how frail I am, that you, God, are from everlasting to everlasting. Help me to measure my days, and in measuring them, may I come to you with them. Uh, some time ago, I was um, at a summer camp in um, Castle Daly, and I was there for the week, and Somebody had prayed a prayer, it was in the, in the morning, and I remember uh, it struck me. You know, sometimes you hear something, be it a verse, or somebody says something, it, it strikes you, it kind of sticks there, and it stays there. And I think I must have heard somebody say this, or somebody pray this so many times in the past, but this time it struck, the bullet hit home. And the person praying just prayed something like, Lord, we give you this day. I thought, oh, now how flippantly I can pray that. Lord, I give you this day. But what does it mean? Lord, I give you this day. Well, for the Christian, I think it means, Lord, I give you this day. I want to walk in your paths. Lord, I give you this day. I want to walk with you. Lord, I give you this day. I want you to use me. Lord, there's people about me that need a kind word. There are people about me that you want to minister to. The Lord Jesus in the days of his flesh 
ministered to others. And now the Lord Jesus, seated at the right hand of the Father, wants to minister to the world through his people, through, his, through the, the Christian men and women and, and boys and girls. Lord, I give you this day. Maybe for some of us here, to number my days, my days are passing and fleeting. Maybe the beginning of our time to be wise is that very first step. Lord, save me. I am the sinner Jesus died for. Lord, teach me to number my days and apply my heart to wisdom. Lord, you sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Heavenly Father, I am the sinner Jesus died for. Forgive me my sin. Take me as your own. I was talking to, um, I think it was one of my little grandsons, and I was showing them pictures on my phone. And the one picture was of a little boy and his grandmother. And it was me. I was two years old, and I'm holding my nanny's hand. We called her grandma. I'm holding her hand. She was born 1889, and there I am, 1957, two years old, just a, a little guy. And I said to my grandson, that's me, and that was my nanny. You know? My nanny has passed away. Her generation, born 1889, has long since passed. Here I am, a grandpa now. I'm growing up, and I'm measuring my days. And here the Lord has blessed us on the cusp of a new year. And so the challenge is that in the cusp of this new year that you're about to enter into, are you going to continue without Christ? Are you going to continue just in God's waiting room, just spinning around in the wilderness, waiting for the measure of your days to end? Or do we, will we say, Lord, I give you this day. Lord, I give you this year, Lord, I give you this life. And how wonderful that God in his mercy and in his grace, uh, he loves us and he takes us, even the leftover days and the years that we might have uh, remaining, that they, though they be ever so few. There's uh, two more verses in the Psalms, and we'll, we'll close with this. Again, I believe this is David. Um, in Psalms. There are various authors, and some of the Psalms are, we don't know exactly who wrote them. But I thought, boy, this, would, this is what my desire would be as I step into this new year. In Psalm 27, verse 4, speaking about the days. One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. And how wonderful to know that God isn't like those mountains of Sinai, just uncaring, cold, and indifferent, looking down upon a perishing humanity, but that God is compassionate and that he's feeling that our frailty moves him. And having moved him, he sent his son to be our savior. And then to be able to say in the last verse of that beautiful psalm, Psalm 23, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And Father, these things are above us and beyond us. Lord, we just give ourselves to meaningless things, to, to entertainment, things that don't count, and things that don't matter. Lord, and before we know it, the years have passed by and the life has passed by. But how we thank you that in your mercy, Lord, that you take our leftovers. Lord, we thank you that in your great love and your compassion to us, Lord, that you have come to us in the person of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, I trust I can pray for all of us here this morning that we look to you, Lord, that you would answer our prayer, that in light of all this, that so teach us to number our days, that we might apply our hearts to wisdom. 
And Father, we ask this through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.